interest messages. Somebody wants to take out an ad saying, we should oppose this nuclear power plant, or we've got to do something about global warming. Um, those kinds of things are not permitted. And finally, ads that support or oppose any candidate for, public, uh, for political office, your regular old campaign, political campaign ads that we're being inundated with. Private broadcasters, Fox and others, can air those. Public broadcasters can't under this law. And the Court of Appeals in San Francisco, um, the district court decision was made by Magistrate Judge Elizabeth Laporte, who I hired for her first legal job a long time ago. Uh, and became very successful and became and was appointed the magistrate judge in San Francisco. She upheld the statute, all three parts of it, and uh, the Minority Television Project, uh, which operates out of San Francisco, appealed, and the Court of Appeals threw out the public service ad restriction and the political ad restriction, upholding uh, Mr. Fiji, Mr. Fiji back there, put it away, or leave. Okay. Um, so on First Amendment grounds, the court threw out both the, the uh, uh, political ad restriction and the um, public service message restriction. The first question, and it always seems to be the first question in these cases, is what level of scrutiny should the court apply? I mean, here is a blatant content-based restriction on speech forbidding public broadcasters from airing these kinds of ads, all three kinds of ads. Um, and yet the court did not apply strict scrutiny. It applied instead intermediate scrutiny. Uh, and that's because what they're dealing with is speech by broadcasters, by licensed broadcasters. And Red Lion tells us that broadcasters have limited First Amendment rights and the kind of scrutiny, they didn't put a label on it in the Red Lion case, but the kind of non-scrutiny that the court applied in Red Lion is usually called relaxed scrutiny. That is, the court's not going to be very demanding of uh, the government in uh, its effort to justify restrictions on the speech of broadcasters. Um, so the court decides to apply intermediate scrutiny, but says that since it's a content-based restriction on core political speech, at least two of these kinds of speech, core political speech, uh, that the intermediate scrutiny has to be robust, more demanding than the usual intermediate scrutiny. I define you to figure out uh, what this really means in practice, but what the court did was say that the standard for intermediate scrutiny is that the restriction has to be narrowly tailored, that sounds familiar, to further a substantial government interest, not a compelling government interest. So it's a softer standard on the government. Um, and the narrow tailoring, which is why the court struck down uh, two of the three bans, the narrow tailoring has to be based on a showing by the government that the harms that it's concerned about, if the broadcasters are allowed to speak in this way, are real, not conjectural. Uh, that the regulation will in fact alleviate those harms, and that the regulation does not burden more speech than necessary to further the government's interest. And the government has to make that showing by substantial evidence. So it's a fairly strict standard even so, Kelly. No, no, the, the Supreme Court has used that before. And it, and it uses it in cable, as we'll see in a few minutes. Relaxed. Red Lion. Red Lion, the court probably would say that the, the Red Lion is intermediate too. But, but when the court first encountered cable in the Turner Broadcasting cases, no relation, the... Uh, <laughs> the court was baffled about what level of scrutiny should be applied to cable. And the government's saying, look, it's television, right? It comes out of the same box uh, as broadcast, and therefore the reduced, relaxed, intermediate level of scrutiny applied in Red Lion ought to apply to cable as well, for reasons that we'll discuss in a minute. But the court didn't buy that. Um, right? mm, partly. Partly funded by... Well, uh, on that scenario about the threat to pull your funding if you air the other party's commercials, uh, that does smack of prior restraint. But under the statute, it's entirely subsequent punishment. That is, if the broadcaster airs these um, political ads, like the Minority Television Project aired a couple of thousand commercials, they wanted to make money off regular commercials, uh, and uh, they were fined after the fact punishment. Wasn't, it's not a prior restraint situation. It's a law, like a criminal law, but after the fact um, punishment. The government's interest uh, in enforcing all three of the prohibitions on commercials on uh, public television is that they will be distracted by the bonanza of advertising dollars coming in uh, from what is their core mission, that is providing high quality educational programming. We don't want to risk Sesame Street. You know, we don't want to see cartoons instead of Sesame Street because the ratings would be higher and you could charge more for your commercials. And that was across the board the, ju the government's justification for the three bans on, on uh, commercials. Um, the court last week decided that the government had satisfied intermediate scrutiny with regard to commercials for for-profit companies. Uh, that the court said that the harms feared by Congress were real, that the ban didn't burden more speech than necessary, and banned the commercial. It was, it was the commercials that created the problem, according to Congress, and that the court would give deference to the congressional judgment that paid promotional messages pose a threat to extinguish public broadcasting stations' niche educational programming. But the court said that the public issue messages and the political ads, restrictions on them, violated the First Amendment. The court said there was no evidence. The, court, the government hadn't come up with any evidence that these kinds of advertisers are likely to encourage public broadcasting stations to dilute their non-commercial programming wouldn't be any detrimental impact on public uh, television programming. 
and there's no evidence, and this is sort of irrational in the statute, uh, there's no evidence that the banned ads would be any more harmful than ads paid for by nonprofit corporations. The court used as an example Planned Parenthood. Under the statute, Planned Parenthood as a nonprofit could place an ad for its services, but is prohibited from placing an ad expressing its view on issues that are important to it, and is prohibited from supporting or opposing a candidate. And that, to the court, didn't make any sense. So the court ends up um, throwing out uh, the two parts of the statute, upholding only the regular old paid commercials view of it. I would expect that, um, that the government, you know, having lost two provisions of a statute by Congress, that the Justice Department will feel an obligation to at least to seek rehearing in the Court of Appeals, if not to um, take it to the Supreme Court. So that's probably not over with. Um, as you see in the reader, I've included the FCC's report on television violence. The Bush administration, FCC, um, took a cue from several uh, congressmen uh, that we've got to do something not just about indecency on television, but an equally bad thing on television, that is excessive violence and portraying scenes of excessive violence on television. Can't we do something about that? Uh, and so the FCC wrote this report, chickening out uh, on their own power to um, regulate violence on television, uh, saying that if the Congress wants us to police violence on television, they should enact a law that authorizes us to do so. Um, and they considered the various means that the FCC then, this was 07, thought would survive constitutional scrutiny that would be consistent with the First Amendment, one of which is time channeling, that you can't put excessively violent uh, material on the air, for example, during the indecency-free hours, uh, 6 a.m. to 10, to 10 p.m. Uh, it thought that the um, requirement of a V-chip in every television set was ineffective as a way of protecting America's children from exposure to extreme violence. Um, did you guys have any experience with the V-chip? Did you have a, anybody paying attention to the V-chip when you were growing up? Did parents use it to uh, protect you from exposure? I mean, it, it, most parents don't have a clue that it exists. It's required to be in every television set in America. There it is. And most parents don't have a clue that it's there. Uh, and while their kids could clearly manipulate and program it, the parents don't have a clue about how to do that. So in fact, it's not used. Right? Um, yeah, the cable boxes all have parental control gadgets that allow uh, parents to uh, block channels that they don't want the kids to see. And th those two, the, the uh, commission is dubious that they have any real value. But of course, the commission believes that it does not have the power to regulate the content of cable or satellite. It's talking about preventing violence on television only with regard to broadcast because that's the only medium of this kind that they have the power to regulate the content of. They, they view satellite and, and cable as subscription services, which they are, which do not use the broadcast spectrum, don't use the public airways, and that, under the reasoning of Red Lion, undermines the commission's authority to regulate the content. What's up, Mark? So, so, so when you wanted to see it, you would sneak in when they weren't there and undo it? Uh -huh. And look what it's done to you. <laughs> um, anyway, the, uh, the FCC would like to say that um, there's the ratings, you know, there's a voluntary rating system in place. All of the broadcasters put ratings on their program. If you can decipher what they mean, they're a little difficult, difficult to penetrate, they're not all intuitive. Um, but they're there. Uh, but the FCC thinks that they are inaccurate, or in some cases that they uh, attract kid viewers. You know, the, the worse the rating, the more likely, you know, it's like uh, the warnings in the, in the Hustler thing, they don't do this. It's for a teenager, for a kid, saying don't do it is basically an invitation to try it. And so they don't think that ratings uh, necessarily solve the problem. If they were made mandatory by the Congress and they, uh, everybody could be educated about exactly what they might mean, uh, that's um, a possibility, the Commission says. But what's not addressed, hardly, in the FCC's report on violence uh, is the definition of what triggers all this, what triggers time channeling or ratings. Uh, how do you define what is excessive violence in a way that does not um, black out Macbeth, bloody, violent, that does not black out um, NFL football games, brutal violence, that does not black out war scenes on news programs. Um, if you've got a definition that will work, that is intelligible and it's enforceable, I recommend that you get in touch with the FCC and tell them what to do. Uh, I don't think it's possible. Uh, let's look now at cable, um, and, and this raises, takes us back again to sexual speech, and this is a, just a refresher on, on the sexual speech arena, uh, that pornography doesn't mean anything legally except child pornography, which is simply images of, what, of children, real children, uh, doing something sexual. Obscenity is the main category of completely unprotected sexual speech um, that enjoys no First Amendment protection at all, and in order to be obscene, the material has to meet all three requirements of the Miller versus California test, appeal to the prurient interest, patently offensive in its description or depiction of sexual or excretory acts, and finally, uh, the material must lack any serious literary, artistic, scientific, or political value. 
Notice what the FCC did uh, when they decided to regulate indecency. They plucked the middle factor out of the obscenity definition and made that the definition of indecency. Patently offensive, as judged by contemporary community standards for the broadcast medium in its description or depiction of sexual or excretory act. What that means, that's the FCC's definition of indecency, is that material that does not appeal to the prurient interest and material that does have serious literary, artistic, so on, um, value can be considered indecent. And that's where the tension comes up in these kinds of cases. Um, now, preceding the cable cases, uh, we had Sable on phone sex. Uh, Sable was a big operator in the dial porn industry, and Senator Jesse Helms at the time was a leader. He was sort of a Jerry Falwell's counterpart in the Senate of the United States, um, and a uh, deeply conservative and religious man who wanted to stamp out dial porn phone sex altogether. And so he got Congress to pass. Voice vote. Nobody objected to it. Who's, who's going to vote in favor of dial porn on the floor of the United States? Uh, floor, floor of the United States Senate? Nobody. Um, so they enacted this law that made it a federal crime to um, put for commercial purposes on the telephone uh, any material that was obscene or indecent using an FCC-like definition of indecency, that is, material that was patently offensive for the telephone medium. Uh, and the court upheld the law as it regarded obscenity, basically on the reasoning that obscenity is prohibited in any medium of communication, uh, and uh, refusing to make any exceptions for the dial-up companies, even though they were getting calls, they, they might be in San Francisco or LA, some other libertine community, but they were getting calls from Greenville, Mississippi, or Logan, Utah, or places like that, where the community standards might be entirely different from those in San Francisco or, or LA. And they said, well, we can't, you know, we're in business nationally. Uh, we can't be subjected to their community standards. Uh, and therefore, even the restriction on obscenity is um, unconstitutional. The court rejected that, said basically, you can block the calls from communities where you don't want to be subjected to their community standards, which technologically they could do. But the big battle, and the more relevant one for our purposes, is over indecency. And the court's analysis in the Sable case was that while it's important to protect America's children from exposure to indecent material, grown-ups, adults, have the right to say and view indecent material, to say dirty words, uh, and to um, hear them. And they can call up somebody and hear lots of them from whoever's on the other end. Uh, and indecent speech, the court said, is protected by the First Amendment as to adults. So how, where, where's the First Amendment analysis here? It's a content-based restriction on what can be said on the telephone, therefore triggering strict scrutiny. The law that restricts con uh, content um, is presumed unconstitutional, and the government has to show a compelling government interest and that the restriction is narrowly tailored to serve that interest. What's the government's compelling interest? Uh, the court accepts the government's suggestion that it has a compelling interest in protecting America's children from exposure to indecent material on the telephone. It doesn't really question it at all. The government has that compelling interest, but says that the restriction in the dialogue law was not narrowly tailored. It wasn't the least, a criminal sanction, a criminal law, fine and imprisonment. Um, that that was not the least restrictive means of, pres of serving the government interest. Um, and that's because the dialogue operators could screen out most minors by requiring credit card billing. The kids are not likely to have credit cards, or if they somehow get access to one, they won't want to risk exposure by uh, giving it to a dial porn company, so that that would um, be a less restrictive means of reducing children's exposure to indecent material on the telephone, or PIN numbers, or some kind of age identification thing like that. And therefore, the court concluded that the absolute ban on indecent phone sex was unconstitutional, not narrowly tailored. Didn't take Jesse Helms uh, more than a couple of months after the decision to get Congress to pass an amendment to the law uh, and to authorize the FCC to regulate dial porn. Uh, and the amendment created credit card billing as a safe haven. If the phone sex companies um, require credit card billing, then um, they're allowed to put on indecent material uh, to anybody who calls up. And as I understand it, I, I don't pay a lot of attention to this, uh, as I understand it, the dial porn industry now is entirely credit card based uh, and apparently still flourishing economically. Um, then there are the cable cases, which followed um, the Sable case, and also um, some of the cable cases involved um, sexual speech. But uh, the first two did not, the Turner Broadcasting cases did not. Uh, the issue in Turner Broadcasting was um, the provision of uh, the Federal Cable Act that required cable operators to carry 